Morning. Let's get started. Kathy's the only brave one with a camera on this morning. I'm certain that there's at least two more of you who will turn your cameras on so that my board is not a big blank screen of names. Either that or I'm just going to make Kathy the spotlight video. I'm going to just talk to her. Come on, come on. You have cameras for a reason. Turn them on. And if you haven't showered yet, well, then shame on you. It's 11 a.m. All right, so let's get started. So the, the, um, the main gist of this session, it is a session that we do monthly. Uh, in the last couple of months, we've done it more every six to seven weeks or so. Um, however, it is our monthly look at <clears throat> what being on a team and or starting a team in our world actually looks like. The pros, the cons, the options, the issues, right? And so, so what you won't get a ton of today is here's the steps involved in starting your team, right? We can look at a structure uh, towards the end of our time together today that, that is the basis for a class I teach called Building a Powerful Small Team. Today is really more about what the, what the requirements are. If you're looking to start a team, what, what does that look like? If you're looking to, uh, to join a team, what does that look like? Because what we found was as, as our uh, organization grew larger and larger and more and more people started to uh, put teams together is that we had lots of different people telling lots of other people all different things. And so everybody had their version of what the rules were and how the team worked and, and what that looked like inside of the market center. And, and, and so we found it, to get, it got really confusing the larger we got to not have this kind of information come from one source um, once a month so that anyone who is interested in taking these next steps, again, whether that's starting a team or joining a team, gets all the information they need to make the next smartest move forward for them uh, from one source. That source, at least momentarily, is me. So that's, that's kind of the genesis of, uh, of how this was built. And so without um, further ado, unless there are questions on that, I will dive in and kind of go through our, our content for today. Feel free to stop me at any moment. Um, you can either do your little raise hand thing or just unmute and, and, uh, and interrupt or pop something in the chat box, whatever, whatever works best for you. And I will still encourage those of you who are hidden behind dark screens to turn your cameras on so that we can have a face-to-face -face conversation. There she is. See, I know if I said it long enough, if I said it enough times, it'd start to guilt some people into it. Now we've got Spencer and Greg and Jim and Nellie and Alicia, and Justine, and whoever, whoever's on iPhone. I love you the most. All right, so let's go. So let's, let's start by having this conversation. There is no right or wrong answer to this whole team conversation, right? There's no right way to do it. There's no wrong way to do it. There, there are different, there are variations on a theme. There are certainly best practices, and there are certainly um, things I would uh, I would avoid, and that's part of why we have this uh, this class set up, right? Is so that those of you who are looking to maybe join teams don't go and join a team and then say, "Oh goodness, <laughs> I didn't know that. Maybe this maybe this isn't what I should have done." And those of you who are looking to start teams and be in business with other people don't get halfway through a, an interview process and not know what to do, or halfway through a, a 90 day trial period and not know what to do. So we're, we're going to give you kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the ins and outs of what foundationally this all looks like this morning. Just understand that anything I say today, you get to make your own decisions about how that, how that works for your team, right? Some of the rules are card, kind of hard and fast as to how the market center looks at teams. And yet most of it, is, uh, is fluid in that you can kind of say, well, th that all makes good sense to me. I'm gonna run that a little bit differently. Again, your business, we just wanna give you a foundation, to, to a strong foundation to build upon. 
So let's jump in and start with answering the question, why do people join teams? This is, a, this is an important conversation for, um, for anyone who is thinking about joining a team or starting a team. I, wh why do people join teams? What's the, what's the point? And so a big reason that people join teams, and we, we, can, we can start with a, a, whole, a whole lot of places here. I'm gonna start with the main one though, leads. People join a team for leads. And what's fascinating to me is that when I talk to people about, uh, about starting teams, oftentimes the answer to the question how are you going to feed the people on your team hasn't been addressed and remains unanswered, right? I, for those of you who are looking to start teams, you need to know that the number one reason people want to be in business with you is because they're looking for leads. If they were really skilled at finding all the leads on their own, they wouldn't necessarily need you, right? And for those of you who are thinking about joining a team, recognize that one of the big benefits of joining a team is leads. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have a responsibility as a member of a team to lead generate as well, right? It doesn't mean that you just show up and held your hand out and take, take whatever the, the client du jour is, go sell them a house and come back, right? There are some teams that work that way, but most do not, right? Most teams require some version of lead generation on your part uh, as well, and we'll talk through that. So as it relates to leads, we suggest discussing the following. If you are looking to join a team with the rainmakers that you may be interviewing with, and if you're looking to start a team, you need to be thinking about these conversations because these questions should be being asked of you. And I would ask it of yourself if you're looking to start a team before you start having conversations with prospective team members, right? So as it relates to leads, do I lead generate too? Or just work the leads that are given to me, right? And what's the structure around that? Do I get paid the same for leads that I find versus leads that, that you give me? P.S. the answer to that question should be yes. I know I said there's no right or wrong answers, but I'm giving you a hint on that one. But have that conversation. What does that structure look like in this particular team? What, what lead generation systems does the team already have in place? Again, future rainmakers, what lead generation systems do you have in place? How are you feeding the people on your team? You know, and, and, and I apologize, I, I skipped a small, a small uh, piece in the beginning. It, it, is, my, it is my opinion. Um, and I, I not only run my sales team this way, but I run any business that I, um, that I get to lead uh, in this same way. I, I believe that when I get into business with someone, it is now my responsibility to take care of them and their family, as well as me and my family, right? I feel that responsibility to each of you. I feel that responsibility to each of my employees. I feel that responsibility to anyone who chooses to be in, in a world that I have any influence over, that it's not just about me. And so, so future rainmakers recognize that, right? And so, so it's, it's not just about you. When you say yes to hiring on your first assistant, when you say yes to adding a member to your team, you're saying yes to, I now have to take care of them and their family just like I have to take care of me and my family. It, it, to me, that's a responsibility that you take on. And so, so, uh, so back into our questions. What lead generation systems does the team have in place, right? D does lead generation happen as a group inside of this organization or does it happen individually? Do we all come in and sit down from 8.30 to 11.30 and do our lead generation together or are we all in a, in a separate spot? Are we all doing things from home? Are we all kind of willy-nilly all over the place? Um, what, what does the team focus on? Is it, is it database? Prospecting? Is it expired? Is it open houses? Uh, are they buying leads, uh, leads from, from places like Zillow? Are they getting a bunch of leads from listings? Right, and what kind of structure exists for you, the potential team member, to plug into those existing systems? I've, I've seen, I've seen um, 
some scenarios where people step into teams and the, the leader of the team has this system that's kind of going, 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 and they look at it as a system that they built for them. And so then somebody gets added to the team and they're sitting over here looking around saying, well, that's a great system for you. <laughs> like, how, how, how do I get myself into that? How do I benefit from that? And if there's no, if there's no answer to that, uh, that, that team member maybe doesn't see the value in being a part of that organization. Um, question number three, what kind of listing inventory does the team carry? Why is that important? Buyer leads come from listings, right? So you need to know what kind of listing inventory the team carries to know what kind of leads to expect. The organic leads that come from the listing inventory. So, so discussion number one is all around leads. It's all around how, how am I, as a, as a rainmaker, how am I providing leads, not only for myself, but for the people that I'm adding to my team. And as a, as a potential team member, what can I expect, right? Can I expect, I, I, I have seen some people join teams that don't really seem to have many leads. Forgive me for saying, but I, I'm not sure why you're there then. Like what's, you, you cannot get leads on your own, <laughs> right? See, that was supposed to be a chuckle and nobody left. Okay, there we go. I'll say it one more time, right? You cannot get leads on your own. Ah! <laughs> See, there we go. Now you're catching on. I'll do anything for a laugh. Remember that. So, so the idea of, of leads as a, as a foundational piece for the team, uh, as either something you're building or searching for, you now have some questions to ask around that, either whether you're asking yourself or asking someone you are interviewing with. The second reason that people join teams rather than stay a solo agent is for support, right? Support is that second reason. Now support can be found in a number of different ways. Let's, let's go through those different versions of support, right? The first level of support is administrative support. Right, a team, in order to qualify to be a team, a team is already going to have a full-time administrator in place before they're hiring team agents, right? The, the model says you grow your own solo business, you add administrative help, and once you have administrative help, you grow your business a little bit bigger, and then you add a team agent in to start leveraging some of the pieces of that, um, of the sales side. If you start to add buyer or team agents too early and you don't have administrative support, here's what I've watched happen. Part of the reason you're adding to the team is because you're stressed out about the level of business that is being done and you don't have time for all the administrative stuff. So you add to the team and somewhere in the back of your head, even though you know you are hiring a team agent, there's this expectation that that team agent will somehow allow for some of the administrative work to get done. And the team agent joins with the full expectation that they're going to be doing all this business, buyers, maybe sellers, renters, and they have an expectation that all of the administrative work is going to get done. So now you can go into business together and three to four months in, you're irritated that the administrative work isn't getting handled by the new person, and the new person is irritated that the administrative work isn't getting done by you as the, as the leader of the team, and you're both looking at each other resenting the fact that the administrative work isn't getting taken care of, and it impedes the growth of the business, right? And I have watched that happen numerous times, numerous times, and it, it near, well, I think I can say 100% of every time I've watched that happen, the, the, the organization um, falls apart. So that there's, there's not, a, there's not a, um, a consistency now to that growth. So administrative support is really important. To the point that I would say, if you came to me as an agent saying, I'm, I'm curious about joining a team, 
what I would say to you is I wouldn't join a team unless there was a, a, an administrative support involved there because you're missing a huge piece of the benefit of, of being a part of somebody else's organization, right? If you still have to do all of that stuff on your own, I'm not sure why you're paying 50% of the commission to the, to the lead agent, right? We're gonna talk about money in a second. So remember that administrative support is there to remove the administrative obstacles from you, the team agent, and from you, the rainmaker, so that the rainmaker and the team agent are free to make it rain and sell houses. The second piece of, now let me just be clear about administrative support. That can look a bunch of different ways, right? It can be a full-time sitting in the office assistant. It can maybe be some version of that, which means maybe you're hiring transaction management and client care on a on more of a one-off scenario, right? So that, so that some version of administrative assistance exists, not just the, the tried and true, this person is sitting at a desk waiting for work to be done, right? So that can look a bunch of different ways. Uh, I don't really suggest or love the whole idea of the only administrative help being some virtual assistant in the Philippines. I, I just, I haven't found that to work quite as well as somebody more local. But even, if, even if you're not doing full-blown administration with that person, if you're doing more transaction management or client care as a, as a one-off um, per transaction, the fact that they're here, I think, is a massive help. To, uh, to team growth. So I would just caution you about hiring somebody virtually who is always doing their work while you all are sleeping. It doesn't work quite as well. The second level of support that a team, uh, that, that people who are joining teams are looking for is coaching and consulting. Coaching and consulting from the leader of the team so first and foremost, as a leader of a team, you need to know that the people who get into business with you are, are going to look to you for that. They're going to look to, to you to figure out how to move forward with that particular piece of business. They're going to look to you first for an answer to a, to a question, right? That doesn't mean that they, they won't or can't come to the staff, come to the team leader, come to me with questions as well. And yet you will be that first line of defense for them in helping them move, move through that. And so as, as rainmakers or, or future potential rainmakers, one of the questions I think you need to ask yourself is, am I ready to start coaching somebody as a real estate agent? How will I do that? What education might I need? Where do I need to go to, to learn how to ask great questions? Where do I need to go? Do, do, do I follow a business plan? Do I have my goals clearly defined and can model for that person in my organization how I work towards my goals, right? Or am I more of a do as I say, not as I do type person, right? You got to be careful about that. As, a, uh, as someone who might consider joining a team, you need to look on the other side of that. Like, is the person I'm sitting across interviewing with what kind of experience do they have? How are they willing and able to coach me? Do we have set times where, where I can sit and have a conversation about my current business, right? Do I meet with them every Monday morning to talk about my current buyers or my current sellers and they coach me through next steps to, to get them to close, right? Or is it all just kind of willy-nilly? These are the questions I think uh, you, need to be, uh, you need to be asking about what you can expect from a coaching consulting relationship. From coaching and consulting, the, the idea of, of leaders of teams also encouraging you to plug into what the market center offers, right, is also huge. For, for you rainmakers, you've got a massive organization that, that you are a part of. Leverage us, right? Push people in your organization to our courses, to our classes to our coaching sessions, to small group coaching, to productivity coaching, right? To anything that's offered to leverage us for you. It's, 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 it's why we exist as leverage points for each of you, right?
And for those of you looking to join teams, remember that you also have an entire market center organization behind that rainmaker you're getting into business with. The third reason that uh, people uh, join teams in terms of uh, support is accountability, right? What does that look like for you? The accountability structure inside of this organization. Again, rainmakers and rainmakers to be, you need to figure out what that looks like for you. How are, how are you helping people stay accountable to their goals? For some of you, that's harder to do, right? Because you don't want to come across as being mean and you don't want to come across as, let me tell you this. One of the things that I have learned over time is that when you're the one who gets to, to say, okay, you asked me to help you get here. Here's, I'm following up, I'm making sure that you're, I'm holding you accountable to these things that you said you would do. That shows more of a level of care than being smiley and nice and, and letting, let, letting everything kind of go. But you have to decide what that looks like for you. Those of you who are potentially joining teams, potential team members, you need to know what works for you. Do you want to be in an organization with a high level of accountability? Or does that make you feel like you're in a straitjacket? Maybe that doesn't work for you. you that, that, that you're gonna move away from rainmakers who maybe have a, a high level of accountability set up because you're not interested in that per se, right? Just know that, that achievement and accountability almost always go hand in hand, right? Before you decide not to pursue something like that. And yet everybody is different. The fourth thing that I want you to consider from a, from a support perspective is technology. Now that's really changing very rapidly as, as command does more and more and more and more for us, right? Because everybody now has the opportunity to dive into a technology platform that is second to none. If you're using it as a, as a solo agent or using it to run your team, you don't necessarily, team members don't have to join a specific team in order to utilize that technology, because you have it for yourself. However, there may be other things, other technology pieces that a certain team utilizes that you think might be helpful. So again, have those conversations and understand what those conversations, what those, um, what those questions look like when you're asking about benefits for joining the team. Number three, main reasons why people join teams, reduced expenses reduced expenses. On some teams, you may enjoy reduced expenses versus being a solo agent. Some teams cover kind of basic expenses like a, a monthly desk fee or the KW tech fee. Some others might, might extend that and cover your license or your MLS dues or your board dues or all of them. Others might also add in your insur you know, insurance premium or some education costs for the year. Some teams cover all or many of those things when you hit or maintain a certain level of production, right? There are standards that have to be met. And so, so the team isn't there to just kind of pay, all, pay your way and not have anything come back in return, right? So there, there may be certain standards that you have to hit in order for those things to, uh, to be reimbursed or paid on your behalf. Some teams offer reimbursement, but only after a certain period of time. So, so say, say John decides to, to uh, I decide to join John's team. John may say to me, I'm gonna cover X, Y, and Z for you. However, I will only cover it starting January 1st of 2021. Like you're, you're on your own through the rest of this year. I'll start picking up your numbers January 1st. Or he might say to me, I will cover your, your fees, these fees that we've agreed to retroactively to when you start September 1st. However, I'll reimburse them to you out of your third and fifth closing, half out of your third closing, half out of your fifth closing, or your second and your fourth closing, whatever. So that now the, the, now the rainmaker is not out of pocket, they're paying out of profits, right? And so, so expenses are one of those conversations you get to have to make sure that you understand and are really clear about what is being offered to you as a team member and you are really clear as a rainmaker 
what you are offering. I encourage you not to have loosey-goosey things like, uh, you know, we'll address this on a case-by-case -case basis. I see that a lot in team agreements, case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, it doesn't work. Because when the team member wants to go to family reunion or go to mega camp and expects you to pay for it, they're looking at this as, well, here's my case-by-case -case basis. And you're looking at that like, yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> right? So be clear about what that is. Set standards. If, if someone is supposed to be selling three houses a month and they're not hitting three houses a month, well, then some of that turns off. And as long as it's clear up front, well, then the, the team agent understands that that stuff turns off until they're back on track. Right? So we encourage you to ask tons of questions around how expenses work. And when you have finished asking all the questions that you can think of asking, ask the person sitting across the table from you, what expenses, what, what questions around expenses haven't I asked that I should have asked? And it doesn't matter who you are in that scenario, ask that question. Right? Because I want you guys to have a real dialogue around what that looks like so that everyone is clear. And then all that gets pumped into the team agreement so that if there's ever a question about who pays for what and when and how and for how long and under what circumstances and what the standards are, you just go back to the document and it's all right there. Right? If there's one thing I have learned over time is that selective amnesia when it comes to conversations around money, selective amnesia is a real thing. And that's not a judgment on anybody. It's just, it's, it's just something I've uncovered over 21 years of, of real estate brokerage. The second you add in a money conversation around it and someone feels cheated, the selective amnesia kicks in. You never said that. That's not how I remember it. I thought you said this, right? So just be clear. The fourth reason that people join teams, environment. Environment. Environment's really important for some people. Environment is far less important for other people. There are some where like an environment of camaraderie and fun and excitement, we're all gonna be doing this together, we're, we all come into the office, we lead generate together, we go out on a Tuesday night and we bowl together. You know, once a month we're gonna go out and have dinner together or whatever. Camaraderie is really important to some people. To other people, it's not important at all. And they're, they're more than happy to just have a flat business type environment. You need to know what's important to you as a member of a team and what's important to an organization as a leader of a team so that you are either attracted to the right teams or you're attracting the right people to your teams, right? Depending on what role you, you may have. So we encourage you to ask tons of questions about environment. Ask questions about turnover. I'm, I'm curious, how long have the people who have been on your team been on your team? Why do they stay? Who was the last person who left your team? Why did they leave? Where did they go? Did they just graduate and you helped them to, to kind of fly and be free on their own and now they're, they're solo again or, or growing their own team? Well, that's kind of a cool thing because that shows me if I was interviewing you as a rainmaker, that shows me that you're interested in developing me and creating opportunity for me, even if that means I'm no longer on your team. Rainmakers and potential rainmakers, this is a really important thing for you guys to hear. And it doesn't come from me. It comes from Gene Rivers. Gene Rivers is a, uh, is a mega agent in northern Florida who owns market centers across the north of Florida in Tallahassee and Jacksonville and runs a, a massively successful real estate team across northern Florida. And he said to us the last time he was here teaching, he said he has in uh, whatever many years, 20 years or so, had over 200 people through the doors of his team. Over 200 people. And he looks at that as a badge that he wears because that's, that's not people coming and saying, this sucks, I want something different. Because it's really important to Gene to develop all the people that he is in business with 
So those people have gone on to become massively successful solo agents. They've gone on to grow their own teams after leaving his team. They've gone on to be team leaders and assistant team leaders inside of his market centers. They've gone on to be coaches locally and, and through maps. They've gone on to own other market centers, right? They've gone on to other things because they learned the stuff they needed to learn and were developed and coached on Gene's team and then took that outside of the team. Don't get stuck in a, in a spot, those of you thinking about moving forward and starting a team, don't get stuck in the spot of, oh, I'm gonna have people show up, I'm gonna pour into them, and they're gonna leave, I'm gonna to have to do it all over again. Because the answer to that is yes. If you're doing it right, yes. That's exactly what will happen, right? When you're in business with talented people, you either grow with them or you ask them what they want. And if they want something outside of your organization, you help them to get it, right? That's called leadership. Be careful about the this. They're mine and no one else can have them and I don't want them to have, you know, it, it, because the, the opposite version of that is kind of like looking around saying, you know what, opportunity is a great thing as long as it's only my opportunity. Right, people looking, people, people on this call who were looking about uh, to to interview with teams, ask those questions. How do you feel about developing people? Can you talk to me about about the leadership of the team? What's the goal of the team? Right, the goal of my team in the market centers is to create millionaires. By the way, that's all of you, so you can smile big on that one. Right? Create millionaires. What's the mission of the team? Do you have one? The mission of our market centers, twofold. To create and foster financial freedom and eliminate financial struggle from anyone who chooses to be with us. That's the mission of our organization. Do you have a mission that you can share with people to attract them? Those of you looking to be a part of a team, I would ask that question. I think it, I think it, it, get, it gives you some clarity around how much that Rainmaker has thought about you and where they're, where they're going to help take you, right? And lastly, number five, reasons people join teams, schedule and flexibility, right? It may well be easier for you to go on vacation or take some time off on a team, you know, if, if there's someone to cover and whatnot. I would be careful that's not the only reason you either decide to start or join a team, because that is a weak reason to start or join a team, right? Flexibility, that's different than leverage. Leverage is a really good reason to start or join a team. But schedule and flexibility is not the same thing exactly as leverage, right? Because leverage is about growth. Schedule and flexibility is about I need more time off, right? So, so be careful if that's not the, the main reason you're, you're pushing forward. And so ask some questions around how that works and what that looks like. All right. Want to talk about money? All righty. Look, everyone's like, yes, please, let's talk about money. All right, so here's what's fun about, about starting and joining teams, right? When you join a team, the commissions you earn are not all yours, right? Lest, lest you think that um, it doesn't cost money to operate a sales organization, someone's gotta pay for that, right? And so, so let's talk about structure. On most teams, depending on the piece of business, as a team member, you will typically earn between zero and 50% on sales of buyers or listings. Anywhere from zero to 50%. In, a, in most scenarios, if you are working with a buyer, buyer splits are typically 50-50. Seller splits 
on a lot of teams, team agents, at least in the beginning, don't get to have their own listings. Now that's, that's not a rule. You can, if, you, if you're growing a team, you can make that rule different and have people run their own listings. But in a lot of scenarios, the, the, the lead agent, the rainmaker, maintains that listing specialist role and leverages out the buyers, right, to the team agents. If that's the case, and the team agent finds a listing, runs into a listing at an open house or has a relative who's putting their home on the market, right? Those listings are all brought into the team, given to the, to the rainmaker, the listing specialist. They get put on the market. When they sell, the team member who referred that into the team typically earns between zero and maybe 25%, depending on the team. Some teams don't pay referral fees for listings because their view is you pass the listing into the team, I list it, it's my time, effort, and money to list the property, which produces all the leads that we then give to you to go out and sell, right? I personally don't subscribe to that, um, to that way of thinking. I do believe that, that incentives and referral fees for team agents passing listings into the business uh, is just another reason why team agents would pass listings into the business. Right. So in our world, we, we still pay 25% on, on those. But again, giving you the good, the bad, and the in-between, well, I shouldn't say the good, the bad. I'm giving you X and Y and everything that lives in between so that you can hear all the different permutations, be writing this stuff down and know what to ask. Right? That's the whole, the whole point of our time together. Now remember, as a member of a team, you have a split with the team and you also still maintain your splits with KW, right? So in a 50-50 scenario, if you're not capped, you sell a $500,000 house, that's a $12,000 commission. 6,000 of that goes to you, 6,000 of it goes to the rainmaker. If you're not capped on the KW side, well then you still take a 70-30 split off of that $6,000, right? until you hit your cap. We'll talk about caps for team members in a moment because they, they sometimes change. So as a member of a team versus a solo, you know, solo agent, you, you earn $12,000, you're at a 70-30 split on that $12,000, the market center gets their piece and you get your piece until you cap. Again, on a team, you have a first level split with the team then each of the people after that split, you have a split with the, with the market center as well. So just, just know how that money works so that there's not a big surprise when you close your first transaction. Now, some of you are sitting thinking, okay, so why on earth would I, would I pay Noel 50% of everything I earn and still have to pay company dollar until I cap on the KW side? Well, and the answer to that is because when I sat and interviewed with Noel, I asked all these questions that I went through with you. And she gave me all the answers that made really good sense to me. She talked to me about the lead structure inside of her business and how, and how all those leads work and the volume of leads that she's, that she's obtaining. So I look at that as opportunity. She told me how she's going to help hold me accountable to my financial goals. Well, I don't have that. I don't pay a coach. And so now I have Noel to help kind of coach and guide me to make sure I'm hitting my targets. Noel pays for and maintains administrative support. So I don't have to worry about my, my, my putting my green sheets in. I don't have to worry about the, the, the paperwork side of things. I don't have to worry about anything. I have to worry about going out and selling houses, period. Right? Noel creates an environment where I'm actually happy when I get up and come into the office and see her and see the, the administrator and see whoever else. And so now I'm excited to, to do that. She creates a world where I can take a weekend off every once in a while because I know she or someone else will cover my buyers, right? And so, so there's a reason for paying 50%. You have to recognize that there's a value to all those other things. Oh, and by the way, she also pays most of my fees and takes me to family reunion each year, as long as I hit a certain level of, of, uh, of production. So now I'm getting, I'm getting education, 
I'm getting a trip, ooh baby. And I don't have out of pocket expenses to run my business. See how that works? Right, and so remember, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You don't get to have all those benefits and not have it cost something. And in this case, it costs 50% of the, of the transaction. The idea of you being a part of a team where you make that up is the volume that being a part of a team allows you to experience because of the assistance with inbound leads, because of the leverage and, and, and the, the no cost of an administrator to you, because of the coaching and consulting you're getting, right? All of those benefits create a world for you where you can sell more houses faster. So the income is made up in volume. Does that make sense to everybody? Because that's an important piece of this conversation. If the income is not being made up in volume, being on a team is a cost to you. If you're not making it up in volume. Rainmakers, you need to be certain that your people understand that, that the, the benefit to them is volume. Without volume, they're just handing 50% away every single time and they're not making any money, right? So be careful about that. Okay, what are the things about money, 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 money? I talked about that, I talked about that. Um, I mentioned that on some teams, you're not able to process all types of business, right? You need to ask those questions. Rainmakers, you need to understand how you're going to structure your organization. Do new team members to the business get to list? Or are they, are they buy side only for the first year until they learn and understand how your organization works? Right? Or, or is everybody just kind of doing their own thing and every, from, from a team perspective? Any and all of that works. You just need to be clear about what it looks like up front. start to move and morph into more like team agents where now they're out taking their own listings and are, are focusing on the on the uh, listing as well they're processing the listing and then there's another conversation maybe they don't get 25 percent anymore because now they're they're taking their time and energy to and so maybe that goes up to 35 percent or 40 percent right the team still has the cost and marketing expenses of the listings and so it's likely not a 50-50 scenario, and yet it certainly could be, right? Those are conversations that get to be had inside of the team. Marketing and brand exposure. Remember that once you join a team, for all intents and purposes, your name goes away, right? And what I mean by that is if I join Spencer's team and it's the Churchill group, well, I don't get to put signs up that say Rick Scott. My signs say the Churchill Group. The things that I close in the MLS are closed under a team code. It's the Churchill Group. So as a member of a team, you do start to lose some of your personal identity. So just, just know that. I'm not saying it's bad or good. When, when, I, when I started the team that Debbie and I still run today, or Debbie really runs today, we chose to give away our names right from the start. The name of our organization is the Home Vision Group because we didn't want it to be about any one person because we wanted to be able to grow out of it, right? All righty, so we got another couple of minutes. Let me run through a couple of other quick, uh, quick leverage points for you. Um, as a as a rainmaker or as a, um, as a potential team agent, know that there are some other opportunities for you. Oh, sorry, I didn't talk about the cap. Let me, let me talk about how the, the cap interacts with what we're talking about. That was the last piece of money I didn't uh, address. Oftentimes, I, I literally saw this yesterday, someone was talking to me about, about hiring another agent in the market center uh, as, a, as a team member and automatically went to, well, once they join my team, they're on a half cap, right? Now, there are cap incentives that exist 
for team structures. However, they're not automatic and they shouldn't be the reason that anyone joins your organization. And I wanna, I wanna kind of underline that and then give you the math to back that up. So here's how it works. If you hire someone from the outside directly to your team, they, are on, they themselves are on a half cap immediately. If you hire someone from inside of the organization, from inside of our market centers, after they've already joined, so they didn't join you directly from the outside, and it doesn't matter if they've been here for a day or a year or 10 years, if you hire someone from inside of the market center, their full cap stays intact for 12 months. And then after 12 months, reduces to a half cap. So the Rainmaker maintains that full cap and team agents underneath that Rainmaker start popping up at half caps, right? Sometimes you have to wait 12 months to hit that reduction, but start popping up at half caps. Here's why that exists. Here's why that's fair to everyone. It's fair to everyone because most team agents are on a 50-50 split with their Rainmaker. So they still have to sell the exact amount of volume to hit the, the KW cap as a solo agent. We, we just reduce that number down because the, the, the recognition is it's not fair that they would have to sell twice as much volume to hit the same cap as a solo agent, right? So the half cap isn't designed as an incentive per se, it's designed just to keep everybody on par. It's a, it's a fairness issue about how the money works throughout the market center. And, 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 and so be careful as rainmakers, I really discourage you from waving that, oh look, you get a half cap when you're on my team as, a, as an incentive piece. Instead, I would just say the good news is after your 12 months is up, we, we, get, to, we get to maneuver you down to a half cap so that you have to sell every, just what everybody else sells, right? Does that make sense to everybody? There are also team caps. If, if, for those of you who are looking to build a market center, uh, build a, um, uh, a team, if you want to hang on at the very end, I'll talk quickly about team caps. I just want to, I want to get through the rest of the content first and then talk about that. So productivity coaching. If you are a team member or a team leader, we encourage use of our productivity coaching program, right? Again, utilize things in the market center like small group coaching that I run, like productivity coaching that Jen runs as leverage points for you to continue to grow. And then you don't have to be everywhere all the time, right? If you, have, if you are a rainmaker and you hire someone from inside the market center who's already a part of uh, the productivity coaching program, or you decide with that person to have them join the productivity coaching program, the productivity coaching program that Jen runs comes with a fee, right? It comes with a 10% fee off of, uh, off of each closing. Understand that when you join a team, that fee stays in place and is split half and half between you, the team agent, and the, uh, and the team. So, it's, so it's, it's kind of split 5% and 5%. Just know going in, if you're interviewing people who are already part of productivity coaching, that's how that works. Know that if you're in productivity coaching, you'll need to have a conversation with the Rainmaker to make sure that they understand that, that that's how that structure will continue to, uh, to work. And then of course, once you're, once you're inside of a team, we absolutely encourage you and the Rainmakers to make sure that you're still plugging into all the things the Market Center and the, the brand itself has to offer, right? Once you're part of a team, don't stop coming to sales rallies, don't stop coming to trainings, don't stop coming to uh, coaching. Don't never go to mega camp. Don't never go to family reunion, right? Be careful that, that, you're, that as rainmakers, you're not building an, an insular organization. You want, you want this to be a, your organization to continue to grow inside of, of, the, uh, of the market centers that support you and your team members, right? And as team members, you don't, you don't want to cut yourself off from all the other things that, uh, that happen inside of our world, right? And I say that because I've watched that happen. I've seen that, that, um, 
that develop. So be careful about that. All right, I think that is all the information that I have that I wanted to share with you. I know we have a couple of rainmakers on the call um, who wanted to just introduce themselves to you. For those of you who are looking to perhaps join teams, introduce themselves to you and tell you a small bit about their, their team and whether they're hiring or not. So let's, let's allow them to do that and then I'll go to any questions and then talk quickly about the team cap as we um, tick out of time. Who wants to start? Rainmakers who are on the, Jeannie, go ahead. Okay, I'm just gonna unmute myself. So my name is Jeannie Kassendorf. I run the Auslander Kassendorf Group. Uh, my team is comprised of my business partner, Todd Auslander, uh, and we have four buyer agents, Max Dober, Josh Caldwell, Brian Barron, and Stone Hamill. Uh, Max is also uh, kicking it with his listings. Josh is about to put a listing on, and Brian has just done a couple of rental listings. So not only do they do um, buyer sales, but uh, you know, uh, listings are also great. Um, we, we actually just uh, put uh, Stone is our newest agent. He was on a four month um, training uh, process. He's now a full-time agent. We're, we're currently not working for a full, looking for someone full-time, um, but we are potentially looking for um, either a runner, uh, someone to help us with some additional administrative work. Um, so if anyone potentially has some interest in that, there also might be op an opportunity um, to be working with one of our buyer agents um, as well. So, so maybe it's like a junior, a junior person. We haven't uh, clarified that yet, but that's, that's who we are. We just sold our 109th home. Um, and woo, we are 59 million. We're looking at that 60 million this weekend. So that's where we are. Hey, Noel, I see you. Um, and that's pretty much it. So. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. We appreciate that. Who else? Who else you, uh, Certainly. Anyone go on? Can I just ask Jeannie a question? Of course. So sure. Jeannie, you said you had a four month training process. Can you expand on that? Well, it's just that we don't, be sure, we don't, we, we do like a 30, 60, 90. Um, we just don't bring someone onto our team. Uh, when someone comes on our team, our team is, you know, we're a little family. So we have to really get to know that person uh, because of the pandemic. Instead of a 90 days, it was 120 days because mm -hmm. we, you know, we really didn't know what was going on. So we, you know, we, we had metrics. Okay. Did you hit this? Did you hit this? Did you hit this? How's the training going? It, it, when, when, whether it's joining my team or whether it's joining another team, not only does it have to be a right fit for us, but it really has to be a right fit for for you. So I encourage everyone that's looking to join a team. It's a, it's really a two-way street. So that four-month process really gives us a chance to get to know the person and see if 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 we really want to make a, you know, want to make a marriage out of it. Um, and again, that person at the end of the time might say, you know what, I like you, but not doing it. And we say, okay. So we were, we were, um, we were happy and Stone's now officially part of our team. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I was looking for more of like, is it a, uh, you have a formal training process or is it more of a get to know you kind of a thing? No, no, we do a, um, we have, you know, we have morning, we, we, we have morning meetings, but we also do um, different trainings. Um, I, I do some training, Todd does some training, Max does some training. So we do it at different times of the week, whether we talk about buyer agency, it's very, you know, productivity um, coaching, covers a lot of that. So again, if you're in productivity coaching, I'm sure you're, you know, I'm sure you're getting that. Um, you know, we just do it, we just do it a little bit differently. But for, for new agents, productivity coaching is, you know, it's great. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. The, the other thing I'll throw out um, to, to that, um, wow, I lost my train of thought. All right, I'll come back to it, Kathy, because I had a thought on it and I can't remember what I was going to say. All right, anybody else who wants to, any other Rainmakers or any questions that, you, that, that we didn't cover that you have, that would be helpful? Oh, 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 I remembered. So, so um, <clears throat> Chris Suarez, who is a mega agent out in uh, Portland, Oregon, who now has uh, expansion teams across the United States, 
his, his system is, it is 30, 60, 90. And what he says is, look, it, it's your job, team member. It's my job to create a structure and a training uh, program for you for the first 90 days. The team member has to either meet or exceed any of those, uh, any of those standards or any of those, um, those decision points in that 30, 60, 90 period. And Chris's, um, Chris's concept is on day 91, if you choose to stay and I choose to keep you, well, now I take full responsibility, right? We've had 90 days to either figure out that this is not going to work or that it is going to work. So on day 91, if it is going to work, it's now my responsibility to make sure it works. Day 91 is also, if it's not going to work, well, now I've blown it because I had 90 days to, to phase somebody out or to, to coach somebody through that this is not going to be a, a good scenario with us. But that 91st day, right, all of a sudden it's like, bam, I, I needed to, you know what, or get off the pot on this one and I didn't do it, so now it's on me. So he takes full responsibility for that. And I think that's a really, from a leadership perspective, is so important to know that, you know, day 91, you had 90 days to figure out this wasn't going to work. You don't get to sit back now and say, oh, you know what, day 120, day 150, day 180, this person sucks. Why can't they be better, right? Because you have to now take that on you to recognize that you have your DNA on that to help that person be better. Right? It's all about leadership and development. It's not about what have you done for me lately, right? And I think that's a really important um, discussion point in this, in this conversation. What other questions exist? Rick, at what point uh, would you say, being a new agent, would you consider saying, all right, it's, it's best for me to join a team? And I guess also at what point, you know, let's say you are a successful new agent, at what point in time you know, outside of adding admins, um, do you say it's time for me to form a team or alternative would be if I have excess business to refer all that excess business that might not be the cream of the crop out, you know, sort of a hybrid system? Yeah. So great question. I, and, and I would say, and I cover this pretty, pretty extensively in building a powerful small business, right? And so I will put that on the calendar for the first week of September so that, so that we can follow this up with that conversation. But the quick answer for, for you, John, is it, you have to know you, right? Whether you, whether you belong on a team or belong on your own, is, it, there's not a whole lot I can say that there's, there's a checklist for. You have to understand you, you have to know what you're searching for, you have to know what it is you want and how you, how you will plug into doing the do to create your own business, right? There are some people who, who get their license and have no intention of doing the activities that actually create business, right? And so for them, they may find a team environment more appealing. Now that doesn't mean that the rainmakers are necessarily looking at, at that person saying, wow, I want that person because they're not able to do anything, <laughs> right? So, so, you ha so it's a balancing act. You have to kind of figure out what am I able and willing to do? How, how are my skills best utilized? And am I one of those, are you a person who thrives in a team situation or are you a person who would just rather be on their own, right? It starts with personality. It starts with understanding what you can and will do. It starts with, it starts with what you want and how fast you want it. I don't know if that's helping give you, give you an answer to the question on, on should I join a team or not. What I would do is I would, I would take out a piece of pen and paper and write down all the pros, write down all the cons, right? Because there are pros and cons. We, ha we have agents on teams who flounder. We have agents on teams who, who are in the top five or 10 of the market centers. They, some, some of them make more money than most of the solo agents, right? And they're happy. So, so, so it's, I think it really, you really have to, you really have to figure you out. And what I would say is give yourself, give yourself six months, know that you're willing to do it and see what the results are. And maybe talk to some rainmakers, see what, see what the opportunities are out there. What, what's available? Who's hiring? What might that look like? Talk to the people inside the teams. As far as the other question, when do I know 
that it's time for me to build a team? My quick answer to that is minimally a year or two into your career, after you've, rep if you've proven to yourself that a one good year is not a fluke, right? That you can repeat systematically the, the results that you have and how you're going to repeat them. I would push yourself right to the limit and then step back and say, okay, I, I've pushed myself twice, two years in a row to accomplish this. It's not a fluke. I know I can repeat it. It's duplicatable. Now I can, now I can take the responsibility of adding someone to my organization. Does that help, John? Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions uh, that, we, that I need to answer before, we, um, before I quickly talk about the, the team cap? I just have a quickie. Yes, ma'am, Kathy. Um, is it recommended as a rainmaker if, you're ha if you have a team to formulate an LLC for liability purposes? So, so even when you have it, that's a great question. So when you have a team, each of your team members still hangs their license with me, right? So from a liability perspective, there, there's the, the same e &O, the same as a solo agent still attaches. What I will say, Kathy, to your question is, if you're operating under a team name, as the, as the team owner, as the leader of the team, I would certainly have some version of um, commercial Li uh, liability insurance because sometimes they will take the the team name and and sue it as if it's a an entity now what's interesting is if it's not an entity that all just falls flat and goes to the, the person who owns it anyway so as long as you have that coverage you're covered uh, I don't I don't you don't need to have an LLC necessarily for in my opinion you don't need to have an LLC to cover you from a liability perspective because the market center kind of takes care of that on your behalf. One of the benefits of growing your business inside of another business is that you get to offload some of that stuff from a liability and expense perspective onto the market center because the brokerage really is responsible, even though they're your team members, right? In Jeannie's case, I'm responsible for Max and Josh and, and, and Brian and Stone from, from the state level, from a legal perspective, even though, even though they belong in her organization, I'm still responsible because I'm the broker of record. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So let me quickly give you the, just the two cents because some of you are, 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 I think, anxious to hear the, the team cap um, scenario. Um, so last year, your Agent Leadership Council voted into uh, existence a, a team cap scenario. And so team caps, are available to any team that in the previous, the previous year, calendar year, has closed a minimum of $40 million. So $40 million or more, you now get to choose as the rainmaker whether or not you want to move your team onto a team cap. A team cap is no matter how many people are on the team, you only pay a maximum of two and a half caps to the market center in a calendar year, right? How that works is probably more complicated than we need to, to converse about um, on this call. It, it, it happens via all of your team members start to hit their own individual caps. And if you've hit the team cap, we start to reimburse you on a monthly basis for any company dollar that we collect on behalf of your team members. Right? That's, kind of, that's kind of the function of how you get the money. But two and a half caps would be the max. So, so in a, we, we have one team that is uh, taking advantage of that right now. Uh, the around town team, Andy Sachs and his team, they, they pay uh, two and a half caps max per year, which is a, which is a huge savings to them. Um, my guess is that, uh, is that Jeannie and Todd will, will say yes to that um, this coming year, because I think that, I, I think, and I may, I may look to, twist your arm more to, to say yes to that this coming year, right? Because you are eligible, Jeannie, and you, you, said, you said no to it because you were, you were kind of, the math was right on the line. I think what you'll find is that the math for you guys this year will not be on the line. And so I think it will really start to point towards a benefit. The whole idea is allowing each of you as rainmakers to grow your businesses as big as you want it without additional cost. At some point, 
the, the, the costs are what the costs are. You know it's a flat number to the market center and you can have 30 people on your team if you so choose and all of that income comes back to you. You can use that to reinvest in the team. You can give it out as bonuses to your team members. You can keep it all for yourself. You can do whatever you want with it, right? But that's the structure of the, of the team cap. Two and a half caps max, regardless of how many people. Make sense? Now, clearly, two and a half, if you're a solo rainmaker, right, you're a full cap. You need to have at least three more team agents who each hit their cap before you hit the two and a half cap. So it's your fourth team agent that really pushes you over where now there's some benefit to start coming back. Questions, comments, concerns, queries? Croissant. Rick, really quickly. So the 50% that you're giving in, like it goes to the team, but um, how's that structure? Is it the Rainmaker after paying out the administration and any other fees, they're taking that in on their own or are they, you know, re-putting that into the business? Is it team by that's, team decides? That's up to each, that's up to each Rainmaker uh, to decide. That's, that's their income. That's their, their team income. Um, so it's all, it's all part of what they earn for the year. Some of them will utilize it to reinvest in the business. Some of them will utilize it to save for college. Some of them will utilize it for whatever, right? And, and so what I would say is that's another good question when you're sitting having a conversation with, uh, with a Rainmaker to ask about that. You know, what kind of reinvestment in the team um, can, can we expect? What does that look like, right? No one's going to say to you, oh, I'll, I'll put in 50,000 next year. And yet the answer may be, well, we're looking to hire so-and-so to do this for us. We're looking to hire a runner so that nobody has to go and put a lockbox on a house anymore. We're looking to hire this, we're looking to hire that. So that's how that answer might show up in that conversation. Anything else? Any other questions? Really great questions. Well, thank you guys for being here. I hope this was helpful, at least as a foundational conversation for a team versus no team. Uh, thank you to the Rainmakers who joined us um, uh, towards the end. We appreciate uh, you plugging in. And if anybody has any additional questions, the next step for this for you, if you're looking to start or perhaps interview on a team, is to go and speak to your team leader. Right? This is step one. The next step for you is to go and speak to your team leader. So either speaking to Dan or speaking to Steve about what your desire is so that they can point you in the next direction. Right. As rainmakers, you're not having conversations with potential team agents until you know that that conversation with the team leader has been had so that we can make sure that that person has been through this foundational session and so they know what questions to ask and know what to expect, right? Just trying to keep everybody, everybody playing fair and everybody with, with all the information they need to make really good decisions. Have a lovely afternoon. We'll see you soon. <laughs>